I was lucky enough to spend an hour with philosopher, writer and man-clown Stuart Lee, where we discussed, amongst other things, milestone birthdays. Well, I thought 40 was pretty good fun. I thought it was really funny, but 50 I've found out pretty depressing. <laughs> this is where I met. Not for about a year. It was all right at first. I thought it was funny to say, well, I'm 50 and what I think is... <laughs> <laughs> actually, <laughs> All right, granddad. <laughs> well, 51's pretty <laughs> good. Sorry. Good one, wasn't it? 51's sort of... Because you can sort of k- k- mark out the rest of your... Have you ever gone in as a 50-year-old, I think? This. Yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't... But it's not as funny as being... It just feels a bit... I wonder if being... <sighs> what is 50 like for being... For, when you're a bloke? Because for me, about to turn 50, it feels like I don't want to be part... into the era of invisibility. That's what they call 50 years ago. Well, I got mugged, actually, in um, November. <laughs> and, and I celebrated uh, mugging. Was this on there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I got mugged in, um, in November. And it was a real eye-opener, actually, because what happened was... Uh, it was November the 5th, or that weekend, and I was walking along with the kids about 4.30 by the park, and they'd gone on a little bit ahead of me, luckily, and I had two shopping bags full of baked beans and bread, and re- and from happy shoppers, like really ordinary things, and I, I was in a long coat with a big... I grew a big beard, really massive beard, after the last thing I did on telly, because there were a lot of jokes about Brexit, and I was worried about being murdered in the street, <laughs> so I sort of went into disguise, basically. And um, anyway, there there's a gang of about 10, 15 kids running along, um, and uh, the blocking the pavement, and one of them stood in front of me and did that sort of, um, uh, sort of like a gangster gun turn sort of hand gesture at me with a lighted firework, right? And um, and I I I think that if you do stand up, and probably lots of other things, but only know it from stand, I think that your fight and flight mechanism is suppressed, right? And so from being heckled or dealing with stuff on stage. And you realise there's an evolutionary reason for the fight or flight mechanism, which is to not to not Protection. be harmed by things. So he was standing there pointing this rocket at me. Yeah. And I went, "What are you saying? You're <laughs> going to shoot a rocket at me?" And he went, and then he let it go, and it just sort of went over me or past me or something. And then I was still in like crowd control mode. I hadn't hit the. <laughs> so you still put down. Had, yeah, I was going, the "Fuck you! You know what are you doing, you idiot? You know you can't do that. You, it's not worth it, is it? You'll end up in prison for shooting a firework at me. It's pathetic. You, you, you fucking idiot, you know." And um, I just hadn't sort of thought it through. And then he sort of comes up and starts pushing me around. They're only about fourteen, most of them. Then then some others go like round round the back of me, which, and then some more come in front of me. And one's like going like he's going to get a knife out. Another bloke rabbit punches me in the back of the head, which I read afterwards is pretty dangerous because yeah. you can. So and then I dropped all my shopping; it all fell on the floor. And but even as it was happening, I was sort of thinking, oh, if it, if I can sort of survive this, it's sort of become material, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know. And and um, and then and then then um, then when they looked like they were going for a knife, a sort of woman about forty who'd been watching in the front garden. She sort of stepped in, and I think that that kind of embarrassed everyone into yeah. calming down a bit. But even as they started going off, I was still shouting at them, it's ridiculous, what, what on earth? Why would you do that? Well, wait. And then, then they sent the littlest one back, who was probably about 11, having rabbit punched me in the head, shot a firework at me, and looked, they were going to stab me. They sent the littlest one back to help me put my shopping back in the, in the bags. Yeah, and the, But it was interesting, because obviously, for the first time, I was had absolutely no power. And when you talk about invisibility, you're talking about I think women of a certain age suddenly notice a sort of sexual invisibility. Yeah. They're not being they're not being harassed as much as they were, or approached, or whatever. Yeah. And, like with, and with with me, I thought, oh yeah, there's no reason for teenage boys to be. I like a look like a little old fat man with a beard doing his shopping, and I've got no. Um, and, and I'm and actually uh, right, so it's a I, loss of potency for you. You're not you, you don't yeah. look like someone that can take on a, an eleven year old. Yeah, I know, but, but exactly. But I, but I I used to sort of I realised that I've uh, quite a lot in my life. I've enjoyed shouting at people and shock. You know, if people are dropping litter or whatever, I'd go, I don't do that. And then they'll go oh, and like, you know, oh, I've sort of done that a lot. And, then, and but also it's it's not just being being um, a, a little old man and it's it's like it's the, having kids as well you think god it's really not worth being killed over a, over a status issue about <laughs> having a firework shot near you rather than directly at you you know but it was weird and the kids were just a bit up the road they'd gone ahead on their bikes and they they were seven and eleven and they they came back and they went are you all right and a, and a woman had said them the the bad men were beating up their dad or something and they obviously it's embarrassing to be sort of beaten up in front of your 
of your children. Then, then, and then at night, I'd, I'd arrange to take them and their friends to the fireworks in the park. And I was suddenly slightly worried about going to the fireworks because I thought, well, what if they're there? And I'm the bloke that had this, like, standoff with them. You know? it's easier to cover up a, fi- a targeted firework attack in the middle of a bonfire yeah, celebration. Yeah. So I had to get one. I got one of the one of the kids has got two mums, and they came. The two mums came with me to the fireworks to <laughs> protect me. You had a from the, personal lesbian from the protection teenage squad. Boys. <laughs> <laughs> so that's <is> perfect. <laughs> and it's real North London. St- but anyone yes, listening very, to this yeah. is going to go. That's the metropolitan yeah, level yeah. all over. <laughs> I I couldn't pinpoint their socioeconomic grouping, but when Stuart said he was protected, uh, you know. But it was a funny. That was a funny thing of like. Yeah, I thought I'm in my fifties now. I'm a sort of ineffectual figure that's shoved around and drops his beans in the street. That sounds like a euphemism for something, doesn't it? I've dropped my beans. Trying, dropped my beans. Well, how's so. you? He's all right, but I think he might have dropped his beans. <laughs> <laughs> that might be where he's at right now. But then all of I don't know. I mean, I suppose I've known you for what. Th- 30, nearly yeah. 30 Well, I remember years. seeing, I saw you on stage, first of all, I think in Edinburgh or in some student gig somewhere. And it was, it was, it was probably about 30 years, yeah. It was really good, yeah. We've, we've gone, you know, as you know, we've gone down to yeah. Austin Center. We, um, I, I'm try, I think I, I don't think I saw you on stage first. I did obviously see you on stage a lot at that period, but I think there was probably a sort of bar in Edinburgh. And we yeah. were all, we all used to coagulate there, yeah. didn't we? Well, it's weird, isn't it, to think that was like 30 years ago, there would have been about a quarter of the amount of shows on, and um, there was a lot less comedy, and um, and there were and there wasn't all these private bars attached to big venues. So you tended to run into people in the same places. I was thinking about that when I was there this summer. Actually, I was wandering around, and um, I, my my wife had a, a her birthday. She's three years younger than me, so she's not had the shock of fifty yet. But she had her birthday in a bar, and I suddenly realised that the bar was a place that I'd done a student play in in 1987, which was not a venue anymore, but I recognised it from the shape of the floor, which was some steps going down with sort of Doric kind of columns around it. And I, I thought, wow, that's so amazing, sort of flashback to 1987. I was, I was the waiter in Death of a Salesman there. And Sam Sam West, who's now, you know, from Narnia, isn't he? And yeah. things like that, he was, he was someone in it. I can't remember what he was, but he was in it, I remember. Um, Abbey Laird Hall, it was called then, but it's called... It's got it's got a, like a one syllable name that's onomatopoeic now. You know that's what bars and things are called now, isn't it? They used to be oh, called yeah. after animals and <laughs> flags yeah, and things. Yeah, it's all zebras and yeah, yeah and tiger, tiger, splurf or something. I don't know. Anyway, that was in there, and I thought, I thought God, this is really. It feels like a long time, you know. To... It does. I mean, but but sort of, but also yesterday in that same way that time. You know, we time is just. Merely constructed for us to navigate our way around, isn't it? And mm. it, it, when you think, when I think back at Edinburgh, it, it feels like I'm sort of still there and learning and around everybody. And and then I look in the mirror and think, who is that old well, lady? You look exactly the same, though. To be but fair, I just don't, though. Well, I think you your do. eyesight is withering on the. Well, it is. Actually. I think and it I'm, is. <laughs> I've got hearing aids, but I haven't put them in. You and I share. I can see. You and I share a tinnitus problem. It's it's oh, right. we we we. I don't know how bad yours is, but I mine is annoyingly not come from listening to loud gigs, which I Nor's suspect mine. hasn't it. I thought it would have done, and then I went to the doctors, and they showed me this that some chart which showed there wasn't a point of acoustic trauma that could have caused it. Yeah. Do you grind your teeth? Are you a stressy person? A bit, yeah. But Mine's I mean, from grinding my teeth, so oh, I blame no. everyone really? around me. Yeah. Really? It's from just so like at night when I can do nothing about it, my jaw just. It, applies right, maximum right, pressure right. so i'll just go through all the mouth guards and right, right. yeah that's what causes it good re- i didn't know that i could yeah. from that what a stress yeah. what we're we doing to ourselves i don't know I mean, what, with what, what, mine's actually been a lot better um since about five or six years ago i found out i was deaf enough to need hearing aids and and actually that seems to have that seems to have changed it. I don't know. It's I don't I don't really get it now unless I'm really really annoyed about something and wound up. So that's completely really sorted it. it more, can... more or less, yeah. So but now found, you yeah. now you're more I suppose attuned to the um the, the the changes in temperature in your audience. Yeah, it was unbelievable, right? Because I tell you why I thought something was up. I did um a, a, a room in Melbourne in two thousand or ninety seven. Maybe anyway, some some room I did in Australia in '97 for a month. I remember it going pretty well. 
Then I went back there in 2005, same room. I thought, God, it's, I must have got loads worse because I this room used to sound really like it was full of laughs. And um, so, and I probably hadn't got that much worse in that time. So I thought something was going on. I just couldn't hear the room the same way. Also, I always used to feel like there were people on the far back right-hand side of the room who weren't getting it, right? And it's interesting. I thought, why do they always sit over there? And also, I started to develop this sort of act, which was very... It became more and more about being annoyed with the audience for not getting that, it. That's so interesting, because you yeah. do in your act talk about pockets of... like yeah, You often locate it physically in a room and go, yeah. you over there. Yeah, I know. Well, actually, that... that I, then, then, then... Then in in about nine about two thousand twelve or something eleven we met I um I met my real dad for the first time it was a whole other story but anyway my wife had been saying you're going deaf all the time so I was going no I'm all right and the first thing I noticed about him was that he had hearing aids in and the, well and his salmon pink trousers but the, and the first <laughs> thing I said to him was oh you've got hearing aids and the first thing he said to me in this monumental meeting was yes. All the men in your family go deaf, and so will you, right? So I went for a thing, and they, and they went, NHS goes, yeah, of course you need hearing aids, put these in. And I had my daughter with me, who was about three at the time, and she was sitting on a, she was sitting on a seat in there, and soon I could sort of hear the sound of the fabric of her clothes for against the first them. Time. Yeah, and then it, it's like an acid trip having it. Then I started having them on, on put them in on stage, and I realised the gigs have been going a lot better than I thought for some time. And I developed this hostile persona based on um, on the, it feeling like it was much more hard work than it was, which is weird. But again, dealing with that, so I remember the first summer I had, I mean, I was at the stand in Edinburgh in the yeah. cellar there. And I thought, there's fucking people talking. I thought, there's people talking. It was like builders on the other side of the road. You know, it's like, it was like <laughs> being Superman or a werewolf or something. Yeah. You had to then learn to get stuff out, which is why I don't have them in all the time because it'd just be too much. But it's absolutely incredible. On, on I, I cannot believe how much of a room you can hear and people mumbling and individual laughs. And but I just have no uh, fascinates me that it was a physiological problem that created the personality to of... some extent. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you've got to be predisposed towards it because what I did with Brenda, uh, Brendan Burns, you must know, yeah, I didn't know he was deaf, and um, he could, could develop this shouting character, <laughs> <laughs> which we now realise was because he he couldn't hear him himself. Hear himself. Yeah. yeah, so. I, was, I used to think, why? Just calm down, you know. But essentially you haven't moderated the way that you speak to an audience now that your hearing is perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. It's obviously a trope that sort of works yeah, it's for you. Yeah, it's worked, yeah. Although actually I'm probably, I'm, I'm not really, in this new tour, I'm not really doing that sort of thing. I'm kind of putting that on the back burner for a bit. I'm trying to do two fun 55-minute sets. This is Snowflake Tourney. Yeah, yeah back to back, because I feel everyone, you know, I feel we do have a responsibility. And I think at the moment... People just need a laugh, don't they, Sue? You've they just always, need you, you know? You've just always been you. known for your civic <laughs> No, they just, just need you. Know. They don't want to come out at the moment and be picked on and told that they're, that, you know. So no, I do think that a bit, though, I kind of think. So you get moment. to do two sides. You get to do um, sort of previously deaf Stew raging at the world <laughs> and then you get to do benign, I can hear everything Stew, tuned into builders 20 miles away <laughs> yeah, with a sense of love in your heart. I know, yeah. yeah. And um, so you've just started... You were doing work in progress, weren't you? Yeah, I'm still room? doing it now. Actually, I've got, I just had one last night, and I, I've, I've, I've got the first time. I got, I got, I've tried to write a show. I've, in the last ten years, you know, I've written about five two-hour stand-up shows, and I've written twenty-four half-hour stand-up shows for telly. So I thought I'd try and write two hour long shows that I'm doing sort of back to back as one show. Yeah. But it means each one's self contained and they're slightly And they're totally they're, different. Well they're not the... they're, I'm trying to make have no cross fertilization between the halves. It's just to kind of experiment to see how the hour long shape feels. And also you can do one really running around and shouting one and the other one sort of sitting down qu quietly with lots of really written sentences, you know, just to sort of um have a have a tonal difference between them, but the written down sentences one is, isn't going as well at the moment as the running around shouting one. I think that's because I'm just too old to learn anything and too tired to write proper material now. And I've been pretending that it was a stylistic choice. But in fact, it was a result of the incapacity to be able to think straight now. And but you you're, can... you're not old enough to, to, to be able to run around. If the running around one's working for you, then there's still some pep. Well, it's funnier, right? Because I, mean, I, thought, I thought of running around 
about, I thought maybe I should run around about 20, 25 years ago, but I didn't do it. I kept it on the back burner. You never moved. Well, I knew it would be funnier to be running around when you were really fat and old because people would have a sense of danger and tragedy about it. It's not funny to run around when you look like you can, is it? No, no one laughs at the athlete. No, either. And that's another thing I... I, You remember there used to be a sketch show where... Ben Miller and Alexander Armstrong used to be naked in it. Yes. I felt there was no honour in that because they were young... Handsome men. Handsome men. There was nothing at, there was nothing at stake in it. You know what I mean? There it was used to no really genital anno- jeopardy. The no, balls hadn't there dropped. There was no genital jeopardy. Yeah, it used to really annoy me. Whereas Sadovitz's nudity is high risk because it is... There's very little... And Malcolm him. Hardy's as well. And Malcolm he was Hardy's as well. Looking, look, at, look at my junk. Yeah, yeah. My withered man junk. Yeah. And you'd cry with laughter. I know, yeah. And actually, you see, also see it with, you see it with, I mean, you know, actresses routinely get praised for the bravery of nude scenes, but I think that the, 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 it's compromising and it can be awkward and embarrassing, but the really brave ones. I mean, there was a, uh, a film, Al- Alamo Bay, I think it was Louis Brunel, and there were, there were, there were could be, but there were, I mean, the sort of older American art house actresses actor and actress Ed Harris I think at the time doing a sort of nude scene where they just looked like ordinary people in bed and that I felt mm. was really high high stuff I sound like I'm working up telling you that I do the show nude <laughs> but I'm I don't, hoping you are I don't, I don't. <laughs> just, if but you yeah. don't now appear naked I'm going to be <laughs> furious all this he was clothed you know it's like a clothed Santa and yet very busy ran around yeah no, there's got. I mean, there's got to be a world in which eventually you move towards an entirely naked set. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. Well, not till the kids have left school, because I mean, <laughs> I think about that a lot. You're never like, beyond bullying, so you they can find yeah. you on social media. And I know. Yeah, but I actually, thoughts. I do actually make. I do make choices about some of the things I do now based on how it will affect the children. Do you? Yeah. Well, we're going, because when when uh, my son was at his first school, I think that I think some things happened to him as a result of perceptions of us as. Um, as comedians or as the sort of work that we did. And I, so I, I kind of... And what would well, those perceptions be? It, well, the, either that you thought you were it and therefore mm. the kids need to be brought down a peg or two or they were behaving in a certain way because of us or or that we were, you know, not the sort of people you wanted your kids to be around because of sort of how people perceive... Show. Certainly, I was offered a part in a film this year Actually, I was offered a part in a film this year and I've never been in a film and I was surprised to be offered a part in a film and then I, I read the scene um, and what, what they wanted me to do was to be an, exec- an executive in a meeting um, and while I was giving the, meet- uh, the talk, another man came in behind and like, had sex with me from, from behind. And I just ignored it. And then carry on with the meeting? Yeah, and then at the end pulled my trousers up when he'd gone. And I thought, well, I can't really do that. And one of the reasons I can't do it is if you've never done any films, but you've only done one, and that's the only thing you've done. And your IMDb credit is man with trousers around ankles. (laughs) I know. But also I thought, I can't do that to the kids, actually. I can't have that as the only thing I've in film. It'd just be so... It's the kind of thing they just have here no end of, or or it would be sort of held against you. So that was strange, you know. Would you have done it had you not had kids? Might have done, might have done, might have, because it quite, looks like it's going to be quite a good film, actually. Um, I can't say what it is, but when it comes out and you see who's got the... It'd be Richard Herring ends up doing it. He's always the bloke. <laughs> he's always the next down. And, um, <laughs> he'd do it, wouldn't he? He'd love it. But it's... Um, and you'll see that scene, you'll go... You'll That's be able to think... There. I said, why did you ask me, actually? And he said him and the writer had been to see me at Leicester Square Theatre and I've been doing a thing where if people's phones go off after I've told them to put them away, yeah. I go down, confiscate them, and I stick them, I pull my trousers down and stick them sort of up my bum, basically, and leave them there for the rest of the show. But don't comment on it at all. And that tends to then prevent any further phone use in the room. They said Do they'd you seen... switch off before you... Park them in no, I leave credits. it. I leave it in in case oh, okay. something in case it rings, and then that'd be funny, wouldn't it? Yeah. But um, they said they'd seen me do that, so they thought I'd be able to do this other thing. I think that's a. I mean, it's quite a leap from a leap, from somebody it? just Obviously casually thing. putting a phone in their butt cheeks to I know. being penetrated in the middle of a business <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I suppose. What time does this go out? It doesn't go out any time, <laughs> Granddad. It's a podcast. Listen, don't you timer. understand? <laughs> it's. What time does this go? That's the thing. That's a, that's that is the sentence that enshrines how old we've become. Is this post watershed? 
Is it? When does it go out? Is it? <laughs> whenever you want. Whenever what? You, whenever you want. Really? For the Christmas. They don't understand now, the children. They go, they go, can we watch, you know, Journey to the Centre of the Earth? Well, yeah. Oh, it's, it's not on... And you, no, it's not on, not on Amazon. And you can't watch it then, can you? You have to find it. And what? They can't. They can't understand. They can't understand not being able to get things straight away. Yeah, if something isn't archived. Yeah. Then it's it, it's it's. Be, I mean, but, but then who controls what's archived? Most of the stuff that we enjoyed what, growing up and watching, you can't. No. But thank can't. God, there's YouTube videos now on how to apply horror makeup. Yeah, yeah. That's Actually, we had, I had, well, you know, there's been a lot of. A lot of the stand-ups of my generation have been dying the last couple of years, and it's interesting when you go to the wakes, um, it's interesting to come across people who are not documented in any way. You know, um, right, uh, Jimmy Miller, Jim Macabre, um, who was, a, you know, quite a big deal between about 87 and 92, set up one of the first new material nights, wrote for people, wrote a great line, uh, if an infinite number of monkeys were given an infinite number of typewriters, eventually they would write, hey, hey, we're the monkeys. He died um, <laughs> He died uh, last year, or it was earlier, earlier this year, and there was just, at the wake, there was there was no film of, of him doing anything, which seems yeah. astounding now. They were all, all that we had was a um, moniker who used to run a gig with him, had loads of flyers and photocopied, you know, posters and that. So we sort of sat around passing these pre-digital papyrus Artif- artefacts <laughs> around. But yeah, things that there's well, no that's... film of, people can't believe. But there were loads of great acts in the 80s that you probably remember that there's no, there's no real evidence of. Well, listeners, the state of the world is pretty abysmal right now, but I think I've found the bit of light relief we all need. The Secret Diary of Boris Johnson, aged 13 and a quarter, is out now in all good bookshops. The book tells the story of how Alexander Boris de Feffel Johnson, a lazy, bumptious, entitled and overweening child, comes to decide that he should be Prime Minister. Along the way, we see him hone the techniques and persona that will one day allow him to hoodwink a nation. Author and comedy writer Lucian Young wields his satirical pen like a sword to expose and ridicule Boris's stupidity, abuses and vices. As this extract shows, young Boris was a man with many opinions. For the past 48 hours, I've been simply teeming with column ideas. Any time a subject is raised, lo and behold, I have an opinion on it. Whether it's trades unions, X-rated films, or the Arab-Israeli conflict, your man Boris will take to his typewriter and hammer out the expected word count. It's so obvious to me now that this is my raison d'etre. I shall fill the world with my voice and my views. And if people don't like those views, I can always get new ones. The audiobook is read brilliantly by impressionist John Culshaw. I'll leave you with a gem of wisdom from 13-year-old Boris. Ten rules to live by. Number six. A friend is just an enemy you haven't made yet. The Secret Diary of Boris Johnson, aged 13 and a quarter, is out now in hardback, ebook, and audiobook. I want to talk, talk about something you said about four years ago that was Uh-oh. very meaningful. Sorry about that. I probably missed that. I was probably drunk. No, he was on stage. Oh, right. It was scripted. Oh, right. You said, I'm paraphrasing badly, but you said the last great taboo is doing something sincerely and doing it well. Mm. That stayed with me. Did it? It did. Yeah, because right. Possibly because a lot of my life is about <laughs> doing things sketchily and poorly. But um, but it's it felt very true, and I wonder if you... If it just sounded nice, well, or what, if you I, were driven okay, by it, each so. right the um, each sh- sometimes it's difficult to go back to um, old shows. Yeah, I think because they were written in response to particular things at the time, and sometimes yeah. someone would go, "Oh, you said this," and but yeah, uh, but actually, it will be things have changed since that was said. But I think what that came off the back of was I was having a lot of discussion, stroke argument, stroke anxieties at the time about um, you know irony in in, in comedy. And um, and I actually think a few years down the line we might be we might be sort of reaping the whirlwind of that now, if you know what I mean. And uh, I think that the assumption was that we lived in a the assumption certainly amongst twenty and thirty somethings working in music or comedy or or media or whatever was that 
political correctness was a good was a done deal, you know, and we lived in a sort of um in a we were the bad old days are behind us and we lived in a sort of liberal democracy where the idea that you should be fair to everyone was uh, in, enshrined and therefore it was fun to kick against that um to to take a yeah. position against it for comic effect but as it happened if that wasn't the case that was a sort of veneer of what it looked like and um and now it's as, it's as if that never happened really you know we're he- heading to well the the next thing that the, the conservatives weaponize will be a culture war about gender and sexuality and things like that in the same way as they've done it about uh, immigration and and sort of cultural mm. identity of that sort um and uh so I think that that line was about that sort of thing at that time, and I wondered what, and I, 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 and I thought, what if you tried to actually just say what you thought rather than trying to be arch or ironic, and so that familiar. worked yeah. for that show. But then there are shows since where I've taken, I've taken exaggerated positions that aren't mine for comic effect. But it was really that I think it must have come off the back of other bits in that in that show. Yeah, and it was it was towards the end as well, yeah, where yeah. it just made a nice sort of yeah. um, uh, bridge to to ending in, in, a, in a moment of sort of unguardedness, you yeah, know, and yeah. or, or supposed that you might have just been yeah. playing us. You you were capable of doing that. Yeah, you well, bastards. Well, you know, it's uh, again if that now, now I'll do shows. I'll do shows 250 times, you know, and, and when, I, when I first started to get some traction going for stand-up, say 2004, that, that show was thought of as a, a hit, but I did it maybe 60 times, you know, and so, and so it's, it's, you, you can't quite, you can't land, I, I'm, I didn't go to drama school, you know, and I can't land a convincingly emotional thing for real every night at the same point to order. Uh, uh, so you do have to create little strategies to fake it now. But probably about the time I was doing that show, I could imagine I probably did put myself through whatever that was for real in my yeah. in my head every night. And now I, um, you know, I, I, I have to use little sort of tricks to make things work sometimes. Cause you to feel it. Yeah, and you can also, some of the some of the shows that were sort of tr- traumatic, the, 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 I did one in 2005 or six, which was about um, when all the censorship about, uh, when we when I was just off the back of working on Richard Thomas's Jerry Spring of the Opera, I wrote uh, quite an extreme show about censorship with a long sort of fantasy sequence in it about meeting Jesus and, and I found it extremely draining. I felt really that was hardcore. That I mean, burned I know, out but, yeah. by the end of that one. I didn't really I like doing it, you know. I, I, and um, now uh, there was there was some some of the shows for um, for a comedy vehicle, the telly show as well. There were there were two or three. There was one about the way that um, the de- the deaths of comedians I talked about, and um, to to get that to work every night at the point where I had to be upset, I would I would think about. The deaths of the family members or whatever, so I could sort of get in the um, in the in the headspace, which actually was, pro- was probably not a very a very good thing to have to do a lot, you know. And I don't really know how actors do things, not just, not being one. It's, and, um, it's it's not a very healthy thing, is it? To yeah. dredge up pain. Yeah. I mean, to dredge up pain is a good thing. To, if you're going to yeah. expiate, if you're going to get rid of it, but just to yeah. for entertainment, that's that what we do. Better we, than doing manual labour, though. No, it's much better than being. <laughs> <laughs> working down a mine. I but, saw a man uh, this morning pull up and he got out of a lorry that he'd obviously been stuck in for ages and he so when he got on the pavement and sort of went, ah, oh, poured loads of water over himself and then got back in it and I thought, God, it's a long time since I've done any sort of work where I've felt so frustrated and stressed out by the actual physical side yeah. of it that I've just had to get out and throw loads of water <laughs> over myself in a... And I, th- I suddenly had a real feeling of... Of luck, and then I walked through London to here and saw where Voltaire lived and blah blah. And I thought, oh, it's great to be alive. Then I got stuck out the front door here because there's no doorbell. <laughs> and I was in a bad mood when I came in, but I'm all right now. You've cheered right up. <laughs> You've cheered right up. <laughs> it's just it's, well, it's like all right. Yeah, no, yeah. Reason, the the lack of doorbell is trying. I know. It's I shouldn't have for, to have no, that. No, not at your age. No. Not at your age. Like also, sake. the thing is, what you think is, it doesn't matter if there's a doorbell because people will go on their internet. 
on their phone. And but I don't know how to. I can't do that. Well, this is the problem now. Is that we've lost our motor skills because yeah. of the internet. Yeah. So instead of just trying to find a doorbell using our our senses, yeah. we what happens is I get a you text do... from our shared agent who yeah. you've yeah. texted. Yeah. And then we come down and let you in. And I've gone on. Google, I've gone, where is the doorbell? And expe- no. I've gone, Siri, where is the door? No, I don't know why. I haven't done that. I don't there know must be an is. app now, because you've got an app where you can measure things. There must be an app which finds a doorbell. It takes maybe. a bit, it can maybe photograph a door and locate the small aperture or no, knob where there's a... I don't what know. are you doing next after the... Not today, but generally, what's your next thing? I'm trying to learn how to be a writer. Well, you've written a book. Yeah, I've written, I've written a book. You are but- a writer then. Well, I know it's a doing word, but but I mean, I haven't done... Do you subscribe to that 10,000 hours nonsense? So that it's just... I mean, loosely I do, in the sense that, that I don't practice... Know. I, well, I, OK, well, with, with st- stand-up and some kinds of music, I think that the, the, um, the confidence and naivety and not understanding how difficult it is makes and, and thinking that you can do it without actually knowing that it's hard does mean that often people's first things are fantastic. Yeah. Right, and then the confidence is sort of sapped, and then maybe they do need the ten thousand hours because yeah. certainly with a lot of untutored sort of music or untutored sort of stand up, the raw first thing is superb. Then as it's slightly finessed, it becomes kind of worse until they actually learn how to how to apply that sort of finesse you get to something. Don't you? Yeah. Some people people will like what you do, and yeah. then what do you do? Do you then just cater everything towards that? Yeah. Group? Yeah. I mean, for you, how much of what you do is purely because you want to do it and how much of it is because your following is so tribal, it's so committed? How much yeah. do you think, what will, what will they think? Well, I don't, I, I don't give any thought to, to what, the, what the audience will want and I try to do what I think will be a good thing. But I'm lucky in that, you know, now that there's, there's a, that I, I, I can do... I, I, I've got the financial leeway to do that. I could lose fifty percent of the people that come and see me, and I'd still be. I mean, I, the, you know, the last tour I did, you know, a quarter of a million people with with no advertising. Bloody you know, hell! With, with, with no with no advertising, and it's off the radar because I don't do ATG theatres, so none of my tickets end up on on those websites via GoGo and all those, and I don't do any advertising, and I do a week at the O2 numbers in London, but I do it at Leicester Square Theatre over f- three times the time. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it's sort of invisible. And I think actually Debbie, our shared agent, is starting to find that quite difficult because the way that um, your value is calculated now is by your Twitter followers and your media saturation. Yeah. Have you been on panel shows? And did you play the Hammersmith Apollo or the O2? And I've, Managed to get a larger audience than that without doing any of those things, which, but actually, to a Netflix executive, you're sort of invisible because you, you're None not, you don't fit those algorithmic markers. Algorithmic of, yeah. marketing, yeah. So, and, um, but actually, the thing about that is it, it means that you not, you don't have to take them all with you because the economics stack up, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I just, that, that's sort of interesting because, you know, the Daily Telegraph or people on, online will try and, hold you to account and go, if you say these sort of things, you will lose loads of your audience, as if that m- matters. It's, that be a, because to me, it's about the f- being free, right? You, you, you know, you're in a luxury, luxury position where you can, you're, f- you're free, you're free, yeah. you're free to do what you want. And so, and so why, why would you not, why would you write something and think people it would matter if people, I would do the same, I would do the same thing. My, my, my goal in 2004 when I realised that the economics of being with a big agency like Avalon, which I was with them, weren't, weren't going to work, was could I, could I do 5,000 people a year and get £10 from each of them? And then that would be... I was, I, if I could do that and not have to change what I did, it would be fine. And the weird thing is, once I started doing that, it kind of snowballed. But, it, but yeah, I mean, I don't... But it's it, a fact that you don't care and, and that you double down that gives... That's why people come because there's a sort of sense of, I'm going to do what pleases me yeah. and I'm going to enjoy it. And if you don't, but also to say, since that, since since the the hearing loss, yeah. you're also they love hear, being insulted. They, they want you to they like it, punish yeah. them. Yeah, but I also think they come. I th- also think people come back. And this is a simple sort of, you know, this this just sounds like someone running a shop. You know, if every every eighteen months or so, there's a new product. 
It's about two hours long, so they basically get twice as long as they do off another stand-up um, at half the price because I do it in places that have low overheads and, I'm not, and I don't have to spend money on advertising or... I haven't got a massive thing of my name written along the back of the... Or a horse or something on stage. You massive know. set. I want to sometimes have really you massive have, you sets, have got but really they're nice kind sets, of yeah. that they have they have to be one person has to be able to put them together. Yeah. You know, and uh, and so it's just sort of like that. I suppose I say what I want, but the actual product of the thing is dependable year after year. You know, and it's I write it, and it's sort of. You also you sell know. your own merch. This is what I love about yeah, you. At the end yeah. of the gig, you will go, you will set up a mini Stuley shop. Yeah, I go. I, well, that that's interesting doing the, sh- the new shop because. A lot of people franchise out to these companies, you know. But when I tour around with a guy called James Hengley, who is one of the reasons that I still find it able to do it, because he's a very easy person to be around with, and we, he he does the tech and the and the merch with me, you know, and the um, and he does the driving, and the, we we basically we basically spend quite a lot of time talking about stocking up the shop and where should we put the shop and stuff. So it takes your mind off the actual stress of doing the show because you think you're. Running a kind of touring, touring mobile, a mobile pop up book, shop. bookshop, yeah, and um, and uh, you know that's one of the reasons I don't do the ATG theatres because they want twenty five percent plus VAT for the merchandise, which means you end up set, having to charge more for your books and things yeah. than they would cost in the shops just to get cover the cost of what it costs you to buy them. It's ludicrous. So I really like the shop aspect and. Um, <laughs> And this sounds like showbiz name dropping, but only to a small amount of people. Thurston Moore, late of Sonic Youth, 80s hardcore experimental avant rock pioneers, came to see us at Leicester Square Theatre. And he was really impressed by us running the shop. He said it was a real punk rock thing to do. And he gave us loads of tips about how they used to do their own. They used to have a thing that said merch and destroy over their, um, <laughs> over their thing and how you, you know, how you can crunch things down to get them on the van. To, to tour them, and he was, he seemed, it was really great to have, there were so many questions I'd like to have asked him about obscure guitar tunings and things like that, but really it was just about the practicalities of, but yeah, I love running the own merch stand, and to me it's an extra joke, because the show might finish with you going, and I hate all of you, and don't ever come to this again, sort yourselves out, and not whatever. <laughs> Smash capitalism, yeah, and then, by the then way. it goes to, thank you, blackout, in the blackout, I can jump off the stage. Do you actually run? You I jump run. off the front of the stage and I run through the audience. <laughs> to make money from merchandise. <laughs> and then I get and then I get out of the back and I get to the thing. And as they're coming out, I'm going, hello, would you like an awesome <laughs> thing? Like really nice thing. I've got a bundle which... of DVDs here that I think for a bargain price of 20 quid. <laughs> yeah, but it's really funny to go... To, it, it sort of undercuts the idea of the integrity of the performance. That that's what I love. It's make, like t- it's total punk. It's basically yeah. saying I'm going to spend two hours, you know, cajoling, berating, yeah, yeah, attacking, yeah, yeah. looking at the capitalist superstructure in which we languish mm. and and curse you all for yeah. partaking in it. And then I'm going to jump off a stage, some yeah. of which quite high. Oh, they all have, I've done my knees in actually, and well, I'm that's, too. That's I'm your too own. Heavy. I know I'm too self-serving heavy to do it now. desperation I'm too to make heavy money. To, no, well, <laughs> it's also actually a really. It's a really good way of of dealing with a particular thing, which I I saw. Um, I saw. Something somewhere I saw it on telly. I don't know why it was on. The, it was the end of a Russell Brand gig, and the, the audience people were waiting for him. And he sort of came down this massive staircase in a theatre, sort of red carpet. And I was going, ah! And I was thinking, oh come on, you know, and and because the sort of music I like. Afterwards, the people are just selling their CDs off the stage, and you talk to them about it, and that's really what makes the yeah. the tour viable. And then you get you can you can ask your question. You can say. Why is the third track on this, you know, played backwards at the end or whatever? So when the people queue up at the end, it's sort of um, it's that naff thing of meet the minor celebrity, but everyone is spared the embarrassment of it because it's um, it's com- it's com- it's changed into this tran- you know transaction. Yeah. They don't even have to buy anything, but there's it's sort of formalised, and also it doesn't get bogged down uh, because there are other people coming along. So the interactions are sort of. Everyone gets an interaction, but it's not. It doesn't become awkward for anyone. So it's it's like a way of, and I am grateful for the people that are coming. I mean, I really am. That's what annoyed me when the the Telegraph did a real stitch up review once, where you know the whole angle of the show was that I'd saying I didn't want people to come and they weren't good enough to come and they didn't understand it and everything. Of course, everyone in there is really laughing at that, you know. And then the Telegraph ran this review saying. If he understood anything about ordinary people's working lives, he would not. He would 
show them some respect and not be I, oh, look at, you show them the respect by doing the two hour show uh, for t- 23 quid like for half the price of what anyone else you know that's and I and, and, and meeting them afterwards yeah and meeting them afterwards and that, and, the, I, and so it really an, annoyed me because I am really grateful for people coming because like you say they 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 find it without um prompting and they they've sat through some pretty hard and misguided things over the years <laughs> That <laughs> didn't really work, and they come back. And I really like the people as well, and I and I like to see them because I like to know that they're, you know, again when you get attacked in the Telegraph, the idea is that you it's you playing to this middle class liberal elite audience. Now there's a lot of them, but there's a spread of all times, and I like it when you see a family where because grandparents come because they think I'm like Dave Allen. You know, and the kids, little teenagers will come because this they don't have this kind of comedy now. So it's sort of exciting to them because it's not like someone being their friend in a T-shirt. And um, so, you know, I like it when there's all... I like, I like seeing who they are. And I like seeing them growing up over the years, the audience members. They, do, know, but, they do follow you. I mean, I've seen same the, some of the same faces at the gigs I've yeah. been to. But also it... it, it I mean, we'll talk about criticism in a minute, yeah. but it seems to me that what you're doing is asking of an audience, what do you want your role to be in all this? Well, it is. And on a good night, the audience are, are, are um, they're like um, a partner in a, in a double act, which obviously I was which in is, for a Yeah, this is exactly how I feel. You know, and, you, and you sort of, you don't, you don't just, right. Another thing some of the critics don't get is um, when they, is sometimes the audience, right, there'll be a, deli- a deliberately rubbish joke that doesn't work. And they sort of laugh at it to make fun of it, right? They, they kind of, they kind of play almost play the role of a certain kind of audience. Not all of them. Some of them sometimes they kind of get in a groove where they, yeah. they they know that they're supposed to pity you, so they do. They don't actually pity you. They know that I. They know it's a construct. They know it's a construct, and that I am disproportionately wealthy given my talent. You know, as a result of the luck I've had in. They don't pity me, but they, but the thing wouldn't work if they didn't at least pretend to so you're inviting them to sort of perform as well and I, and um and and the, 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 I think I, and they rise to the challenge and I think a, I think a load of a load of people you know sometimes a load of people are really great and it and and they can sort of they 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 uh, also somewhere like uh, Glasgow Liverpool sometimes some of the places that people think are oh, they're tough there they are, but they don't want to kill you. No. They want to toy with you like a cat and keep you alive. They want to keep you alive to see what happens. And once you understand that, they don't want you to fail, but they want you to work hard. Right? They have That's, higher expectations. They have higher expectations, and I, and I like that about them. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and you know, I, I, we're living in a period where a lot of the times when you see large crowds of people and you hear the things they're chanting, you feel a sense of despair. But I, the large groups of people. In rooms, sometimes for things there, like, you know, it's some really me. nice audiences you get, and you know. because they are, they are being part of your audience. You are collectively taking on the responsibility of yeah. being your sparring partner. Yeah, yeah. And even though we haven't got words, and we're not, we, yeah. we, that that's not our role. The atmosphere, and as you say, the the you get to we get to be cretins, and you get to be bombastic. <laughs> yeah, and it and it works, and in many yeah. many ways, as you've said, it, it it replicates in simple form what you were doing in your yeah, in your yeah, double yeah, act. Yeah. Well, I'm actually, not, one yeah. of the things that is, that is there, you know, from from the double act is sometimes, you know, you 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 find your. I, mean, I don't, I don't do the other voice but it's sort of implicit as if there's an argument with an imaginary person you know or um uh because i mean really we can dress we can dress a lot of comedy up as right writing and the choice of words and whatever but ultimately it's about uh, a rhythmical thing uh, that people find pleasing and that that that's got uh, you know there's counterpoints in it and yeah. one melody is sort of doing this and the other one's undercutting it and so it's where those where those sounds and rhythms fall um, and uh, if you think about, well, I always think about music starts. If you imagine it as like a, I don't, it always starts with nothing. That is, yeah. the, that's the canvas. Yeah. And so that's well, us as an audience. About isn't cool. You did the conducting thing, didn't no, you? I love music. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I think you're right because so much of writing and performances about um, juxtaposing the lyrical with the percussive, yeah. and yeah. you know, a lot of 
what I love about you, you, when I think about what you do, I think of minimalism and I think of the, 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 the phrasing and it gets repeated. Well, that's because I've ripped that off. <laughs> but, it's, but no one did it in comedy. People did it in music, but no yeah. one did the, yeah. how will you feel if I say the same thing again and again and yeah. again and but it, it can changes. it be different, yeah. It's and different. every time it's different. Yeah, it's different because of how it's responded to as well. And before it was just um, reincorporation, it would be the idea. There's someone tell yeah. a joke and then 20 minutes later there'd be a callback. Yeah. But you're almost doing callbacks in the in, yeah. in the moment. In you moment just... Yeah, I mean, uh, there's two two things said there. One really, so I heard Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead on the radio, on the radio being interviewed the other day. It was a brilliant interview. He talked about textures and dynamics of music. He talked about the brilliant the difference between uh, the silence in a room and then as the orchestra starts that little moment. And it was a really great description of moving from expectation to the f- excitement of it. Really great. The other thing I was thinking about was. My wife's gone off to see, um, is going to see a, a musical, a famous musical for some reason. And, I, and, um, and the, I remember when we worked on Joe Springer, the opera, it was really difficult because when it, when it moved up from a fringe show to a West End show, it wasn't enough to just have the music. The music had to be arranged, right? That meant it had to have layers of string accompaniment or whatever. And that was really difficult because the music that Richard had written, Richard Thomas had written, worked often in dramatic opposition to the to the words. So there was a comic tension between either the violence of the words and the and the romanticism of the music or the romanticism of the words and the violence of the music. Once you bring an arranger in, an arranger has to decide mm. whether the arrangement is going to support the music or the lyrics because it can't emotionally do both because they were pulling in different directions and I think the arrangements compromised it. In a way that it that it meant it was never as good again because it was because the audience were directed to emotionally respond to it in a certain way. Yeah. And what I like is there's always sort of two things in opposition. You know, two things in opposition. You try and try and try and do that in the stand up to perform sensible, serious things as if they were stupid or stupid things yeah. as if they were serious. And pretty much everything seems to come down to that. It's like, otherwise it's just all two one note, just rolling forwards. You, it's, sort of, it's rage and futility, isn't it? It's like yeah. such strength and then underneath it this incredible, brittle vulnerability of we're yeah. all fucked. Yeah. We're all fucked. Yeah, well. I do, I do uh, and man, I know you love music, but I, I, I do think so much of the success of what you've done not not just because you're incredibly strong at performing but it's because the way you write and the way things sound and it has the, sometimes it's just very hypnotic so i've i didn't well, i didn't get this boring voice that's what it is as well it's the, the solly hull vowel yeah yeah that's what robbie williams robbie williams came once i didn't know he was in but he left at half time and uh, <laughs> as he was going the usher said to him oh you know and he went i oh, he should do hypnosis tapes, that bloke. He said, I thought it was really funny. <laughs> Grass & Co. is a premium range of products that blend the highest quality 100% natural CBD with therapeutic botanical ingredients. The organic CBD and botanical formulations have been specially created to bring balance to your body and mind with the most delicious, smooth flavours. The new Grass & Co. Calm CBD range includes balancing botanicals Evening Primrose, Ashwagandha, chamomile, marula and mint to help relax your body and calm your mind. Now, many people who've already tried CBD oils think that the challenging taste is just something you have to put up with to enjoy the benefits. But the guys at Grass & Co. disagree. They've blended their CBD with organic botanical ingredients, including ginger, turmeric, orange and mint for the most delicious smooth flavours. If you're new to CBD, the best-selling 500 milligram Calm CBD oil is a great starting point. As with all supplements, CBD will affect everyone differently. So start low and steadily build your dosage every day so you find the balance that works with your body. The Grass & Co. Calm range brings peace and tranquility to your day with CBD consumable oils, nourishing body oils and peaceful pillow sprays. Comforting aromatherapy scents have been specially blended to quieten your mind and soothe your body. The Grass & Co. Complete range delivers exactly what you need when you need it, whether that be taking the CBD oil first thing in the morning to prepare for a busy day at work, or at the end of the day, the aromatherapy scents can help reduce sleep anxiety and establish the habit of falling asleep. Simply spritz the calm pillow spray generously onto your pillow and bed linen. Inhale the pure aromatherapy scent slowly and deeply to welcome a deep, restful sleep. And now, listeners to this podcast can get 20% off the full range. Just head over to www.grassandco.com 
forward slash hour. Grass & Co are the CBD wellness experts and are committed to delivering the best product range to their customers. Quality and integrity drive their approach to everything they make and do. They openly share the certificates of analysis with customers on website product pages. With no trace of THC, Grass & Co CBD oils are totally legal to buy and consume within the UK and most EU countries. I've tried them and they're great. So get 20% off the full Grass & Co range by going to www.grassandco.com forward slash hour and entering hour at checkout. Grass & Co. Life enhanced by nature. There's so much of what you do that's about absorbing criticism, absorbing uh, and I wonder how much of that is just externalising what's what's inside. I mean, uh, you you will publish, you know, the, your latest book, March the Lemmings. It's all about you've included the, the under the line yeah. stuff that you've got from the columns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a glee. Yeah, well, I mean, I I think that I I think that part of absorbing the, the criticism is that. When, 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 obviously, you, with stand-up, you, if you're doing it under your own name, you are yourself. You're not a pub landlord or a, an urban warrior or whatever you are yourself, but you, you, you have to, you know, exaggerate bits of yourself. And I, I think that what lo- lots of different people helped me to work out who the stand-up was. When I first lived in London, 89, 90, I'd come in from my temp job complaining about things, and the people who I lived with at the time, principally Richard Herring, who I ended up doing the double act with, w- would say, that just sounds like material, your actual opinion of your description of your day. You've had such an extreme, unself-aware response to that. <laughs> it sounds like... So they sort of kind of, people sort of help you realise what's... what. I suppose what a theatre person would say is, what's your clown, you know? Yeah. And then subsequently, when the internet was invented, I didn't really realise what was going on on the internet for about ten years. And then when... I think the first series of comedy vehicles on. I realised there were all these forums of people. Mm. This is about two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. Yeah, was commenting on it, and I started looking at them, and loads of the things they hated about it was sort of what I was trying to do. You know, they'd go, "It's this smug, detached person trying to build up, make everyone think they're clever and they're not." And I thought, well, "Yeah, that's sort of what he is, right?" So. I, Looked at all those criticisms and between the first and second series of Comedy Vehicle, the criticisms really strengthened it because I became more like the things that people didn't like. But it's interesting you said thought, that's what he is. I mean, that's, yeah, I know. You've used Man, a third, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. I do it all the time. Yeah. And but I, can and you I, work out what, I mean, I'm not asking you for percentages, but yeah. I mean, presumably it's just, it, it. sometimes it's very you and sometimes it's a posture, I guess. Yeah, it is. I mean, so I, and also sometimes I'm inside my head and he's going on and I'm sort of thinking, what... What if he said this now? It'd be absolutely awful. And then he'll say it, and I'll go. Oh no, I've got to try and get out of that. And he's really, um, he's put me in a really difficult position. <laughs> so it's sort of like you can force, you know. And I do th- again, but again, it's like two things in a, you know. There's, yeah. You, 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 look, I think anyone who writes anything's got to be able to split their brain in some way, like that. You know, to sort yeah. of you have the the thing that's doing it, the thing that's, that's commenting on it. But not pe- not many people are brave enough to go. What's everyone can think of the worst thing in the world, but yeah. not many people will let it escape their mouth. Well, that's the that's the um, that's one of the things that's in those American script writing ha- handbooks, isn't it? You know, put your character in the most incredible jeopardy and then try and work back from it. But yeah, it's sort of what what position can you put yourself in? You know, and I, also in every show, I try and do something that I'm not very good at, whether it's trying to sing a song or. Oh, I love that though. Else. There, that's the vulnerability bit underneath the, oh. the um, the bluster. But maybe he says something awful, okay. and Stu Lee has to work out how he feels about that. Yeah, I know. Although, although again, you must you must ha- have that. I mean, you 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 um you have to go into for for um a bake off or something. You have to kind of you have to step up into a sort of you, okay. The, what's interesting about that is you're, the pair of you were doing a TV presenter job. But there's still the you're you're still the double act in it, yeah. You know, and so there's two things happening there, aren't there? You you have to deliver televisual information, and yeah. Yet at the same time, there's, there's a suggestion that the people, the two people that have been given this job, have some historic bickering relationship, which isn't yeah. what happens with people who are presenting Antiques Roadshow. Yeah, or something, no, is it? absolutely. Not, which is clearly what people, again, when they tried when they tried to, I expect you've signed a non-disclosure agreement. No, I can say anything. Well, when, anything. when they tried to. When they tried to 
didn't people typically of Tony didn't really understand that there was some other thing going on there which was bigger than the sum of its parts. You know, so when you move it over, you can't you can't just recreate that relationship with some other people because it's an organic thing. It's not going to be the same. You know? I suspect. I suspect what 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 our um, our counterpoint was is that we were in together. We feel like subversive children we feel yeah. like yeah. The, f- the faces may have withered yeah. but inside there's just this caprice okay you get this you can't believe you've been allowed to do that sort of thing so yeah. you, and, what, what, and what would they do they'd have fun with it wouldn't they you yeah, know? It's like yeah. An, and then suddenly you're in this it didn't always it didn't start that way but suddenly yeah. you become this this culture part of this culturally safe enshrined thing and yeah. yet inside you're delinquent children yeah. watching people watching ovens. Yeah. And yeah. um so I get it, yeah. That you can you can have and, and I they would record hours of me deconstructing it mm. and just deconstructing a time check. I'd do a twenty minute time check, which mm. would be about <laughs> the pointlessness of everything and they would never use it. But that's fine, as long as I got to say it. I did realise there was a, a, a limitation to with me to in, in between the in between all, all, all the series of comedy vehicle, there was always reluctance about recommissioning it. Yeah. However, however, really, however many BAFTAs it won or British comedy was, there was never, I could never quite get anyone to. In between the first, maybe the second and the third series, it was, it was suggested that I, I, I would, you know, and it was getting reasonable figures as well. It was suggested that it would be easier to recommission it if I became a sort of BBC Two personality and went on lots of things. Are you telling me they asked you to do Celebrity Bake Off? No, but they did ask me to host a culture show, right? And I thought, look, that doesn't help me, does it? Because I, I can't host a culture show and be nice about to think about people and things and then do the, that show. So it doesn't make sense. It's too different, you know. So I went, look, I'm not going to... It actually will compromise the, that thing to go and do those things. It just... Yeah. The nature of the comedy vehicles it just wouldn't work to also be hosting the culture show. And also, because I do like lots of culture, I could only really have done things that I actually was interested in or liked. I wouldn't be able to... So I wrote a routine about how annoyed I was that the BBC had asked me to host the culture show and that I that was culture. the recommissioning process? And that, and that I was better than the culture show because I directed an opera and the culture show every week should just be me interviewing me about things that I'd done and that um, and that, that Andrew had along with the hating Andrew Graham Dixon and him going around art galleries and things and then saying he was the crumpet man's, that Joan Bakewell had been the thinking man's crumpet and he was the crumpet man's thinker and stuff. I basically deliberately burned all the bridges with it and I heard, found out some people that worked on the culture show were very upset about it because I mean I do quite did quite like the culture show and it was fighting a losing battle against the uh, people feeling art and culture is irrelevant anyway. But I thought I've got to do this because he wouldn't do that right and he would he would be he really would. angry about the idea that he should go and host the culture show in order to get his own. <laughs> Thing on so, but do you get annoyed that he is crushing? I mean, not necessarily the culture show, but he crushes opportunity. He does, yeah. But but and then I don't. But then you know we'll do all right. I mean I don't. That's why he does crush opportunity. Yeah, and he and he's got he's done something in the news show that means it'll be <laughs> it'll be very difficult for Netflix to buy it. And Debbie said, well, if you just Debbie's drop... already said that, so we share an agent. And Debbie, who is <laughs> magnificent. I, I asked after you yesterday and she said he... he she said exactly that. It's, it's going to be very difficult to sell him on. <laughs> but then... <laughs> because he's made that happen. Yeah, but then he would, wouldn't he? Because he... What does he want from you? <laughs> I don't know. Well, just, he wants you to just live in a well, ditch, no, ranting in a I ditch. Did, but, you know, but even... Cursing people okay. who walk past. This is the thing, isn't it? You're like... Okay... But you get, you get, I know that loads of people come. I know it's loads of people's favourite thing. And I know that people that really know about stand up will go, oh, this was one, this person's one of the better, the better people, you know. And then you get this really odd blip where you might get something like The Times saying, you know, The Times said, I'm the world's greatest living stand up. You know, meanwhile, your nephew has li- literally, can f- no, he's never, doesn't really believe you even do it. You know, it's sort of, you can't really. Uh, my nephew said to me, so did you go on like TV and stuff? And I went, yeah. In fact, um, I've produced more um, 
uh, hours of stand-up for television than any other living comedian, and it was more critically acclaimed than the similar work of anyone else. And I could just see him sort of looking at me, just thinking, well, why'd have, I'd have seen it, wouldn't I? You know, like, I thought it'd be funny to just say that really bluntly to a 13-year-old and see what happened. And, um, and they don't just, you can just see it's just can't be processed. So, but, so on the, but then, so on the one hand, you're thinking, well, I do all this stuff, so I should be able to get, to do, to get money to film things or whatever. But then on the other hand, it's my choice not to join in and to remain free. And I still have a really good, good life. So I don't really, you can't really complain. You know, you can't really complain. And, and, and um, I can move around largely without anyone bothering me. Um, and, and you, you know, if you, you must have, you know, I remember being, we met in, we met in um, Edinburgh a few years ago and, you know, you were, we were in a, a sort of tent somewhere in a, in a, Square having I'm a always coffee. In a tent. We're having a coffee, and um, really? my, you know my my um, my stepfather and his partner were just sort of the the couldn't really believe that I would know you, you know, because you're you're on that level of fame. It must be it's quite crazy. difficult. I don't th- I don't think about it right, though. Yeah. I just I yeah. sort of I I can't inhabit. I don't have a her. I guess I am just yeah. I'm more integrated in yeah. that that way, yeah. and I sort of think. People are usually nice, and that's yeah. great. And I think if I, I mean, it's 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 waned now. Anyway, it's also temporary. All that silly stuff. Yeah. But um, God, I, 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 I'm glad I didn't peg my sense of self worth onto it because yeah. the celebrity index can only, it only goes one way, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. In the end, yeah. Well, that's like all political lives end in failure, in failure or death, don't they? Yeah. It's the same with um, very few people get to leave. The world of celebrity being as uh, as popular as they... as faced and yeah, yeah I guess yeah. it's for me it's about um, because I didn't have a, a her going don't do that yeah I yeah. often said yes to things that possibly in one reflection were less that so you've always however painful it's been for you and however awkward it is to say this I suppose you're one of for me those people that you aspire to be because there's that rigidity of purpose <laughs> but maybe it's not like maybe it's yeah, Maybe but, it's never been that discipline for you. No, well, there's not, you know, I, I, I can't really cope with lots of other things, you know. I mean, I can't really, I can't, in the end, I can't really work a lot with other people. I just get sort of worn out with it, even when they're really nice. Um, By the compromise? Um, yeah, just, well, just, I just can't. And I, 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 I don't like the amount of time it takes to finish. I like the fact with stand-up you can do it on your own terms and get it done and then do something else and, you know... Um, I can't, you know, I can't learn lines. I can't, you know. I the hallmark of a comic is there's no transferable skills, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. no, well, yeah. Actually, you know, no transferable skills. That is that is something that's changed. I think. I think that um, when we started, a lot of the people doing it, there probably wasn't. They were sort of. It felt like a calling, you know, and, and the, because there wasn't. The, the, yeah. There the, the, the wasn't the. Um, no one knew. That you could do stadiums or become. There was no live at the Apollo. No live there at the was Apollo. No. It was just, I mean, I, I, my ambition when I started, and it was, it was, I thought it'd be great to be able to do a thirty-day tour at some point of hundred and twenty seater art centres. You know, that was really it was yeah, like being a folk singer, wasn't it? And then, and, yeah. and then, and te- even telly. I mean, telly wasn't like it is now. It was, you know. But also, it's changed so much so that Edinburgh now, if you go to 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 listen to an hour and some may be great by the way i don't mean it's to denigrate anyone's work but it, it'll be it'll be mining pain and tragedy yeah. thematically for 60 minutes yeah. and then you're out and on to the next one yeah. and there's well there's uh, yeah. you know there's become well but they, you know there were there were 10 stand-up shows when i first went to the end fringe in 87 there'll be 400 now you know 500 and and they've become formulae and i i kind of think it's, well, it's true. This is true of so many things in modern culture. You, you kind of you've described a trend in in stand up, which is for the the spill your guts personal show. Mm. And there was a moment where that looked like it was going to be a dominant trend, but then what happens now is lots of things carry on simultaneously. For years, the Telegraph, which seems to come up a lot, <laughs> was trying to say that there was a right wing comedy movement, and there never was. There'd be maybe two people, yeah. But now there is. But there's 
a really extreme left-wing one and there's a spill your guts one and there's a surreal one and they're all happening simultaneously because there's um because there's enough ways for people to find out about and that means yeah. that nothing happens at the expense of another one and a lot of the american stand-up seems to be furious about uh Hannah Gadsby doing well in America because they, I think partly because it's raised their game a bit and it's made them think they should try and write hours that make some sort of sense and not be so shit. But also, they're all, they're, the way they attack it is, are we all supposed to cry and talk about being assaulted now? No, you can do what you want, right? That's not, that's just, that's a thing. That's a way of doing it, but there's other ways of doing it as well and they all happen. I think they're furious can, that they, you know, they want her pain without having to go through it. They want right. to have the anecdote of yeah. the pain without experiencing <laughs> the pain. And it's like, the reason that, I mean, that show sort of, uh, you know, was explosive because it, again, it's what you do, which is saying, why don't you look at yourself for a second? You've just laughed. You've taken, you've participated in the relief of tension. Now mm. let me tell you what really happened and see how you sit with that. Yeah, and yeah. That was just a very interesting exercise in what is, yeah, in, in, in what's demanded of a, of a, of a, cr- of a renter crowd, which yeah. is what you're part of. Yeah. But yeah, it does say that the people that rail against her, it's like, okay, do you want to rewind and go through what she went through? Yeah, and yeah. then, and then, yeah. then it's, your hour is just a But also, it's but not stopping do you doing your thing no. anyway. Everyone you know? has pain. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, um, I remember the late Jeremy Hardy going on stage in Cornwall and goes, I bring news, everyone has light. It's not just, you know, that made me <laughs> like, it's the same, everyone has pain. It's just, yeah, some people don't want to access it. And I think certain rank and file comics don't want to go there because they're just more comfortable with. I often think this a lot. I mean, when um, when Jimmy Carr got done for that tax avoidance, and I thought, right, he's either finished now or he writes a brilliant show yeah. about it. Yeah, you know, which seems seems to be a, a, a way out for some of the some of the people in the states being accused of sexual impropriety. There seems to be the suggestion that if they manage to address this in some way, almost like a medieval public yes. uh, flagellation, then that the show will be the redemption. I thought it would have been the making of him as a comic. But it never occurred to him. I talked to Eddie when I had done the bill and all that. You know, I thought that'd be amazing to see Jimmy Carr talk about yeah. something. And, and in a way, what a gift. We all sort of wish, in a way, something would happen to us that would be that interesting. Like when I was being mugged, I yeah, was sort of thinking, it's material. It's interesting. And when Boyle, Boyle's got in trouble for for tasteless jokes, not so much anymore because he's been sort of reimagined as a sort of liberal satirist, but when he used to get in trouble for tasteless jokes, I think it was really interesting that those jokes were probably written by a team of writers anyway, which he was required to sort of front out. And I thought, what an interesting show that would be to take the joke you'd got vilified for the tabloids about, talk about the process by which it was constructed and then write, you know, I thought, I kind of think with a lot of the mainstream acts, there's a brilliant, brilliant show staring them in the face, but it would mean they... We'd have to sort of step back a bit from the from the, the thing there. Well, the, me- the sort of horrific mechanism of achieving authentic- authenticity, <laughs> yeah, authenticity yeah. which is you say you have you know comics who have a team of writers fabricating anecdotes about their nan. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's yeah. and that's as you say. I mean, there's a there's a there's a multiverse. There's lots of yeah. different types of comedy going on simultaneously. But yeah. but that well, that's an interesting thing. That, that's happened quickly. Is that again when we started? And it really is funny. Sound, how quickly you sound like. Old club comic. When did working. we get so well, gnarly? When we man. started, there was a sort of thing. One that we people wrote their own stuff. It was a sort of defining thing of of the alternative comedy from the eighties. Was that you wrote this stuff? And now, then there was a sort of hush hush period about ten years ago, where lots of the big names were using teams of writers, but they were given odd job titles to sort of disguise it. Oh, and now. People just go, "Oh yeah, I'm a writer for so and so," and I go, "Someone was telling me they're a writer for so and so the other night." I knew the other writers were, and I went, oh, you shouldn't really be telling me this, because I don't want to know that, because to me it's an embarrassing thing. But they, And then I thought, oh, yeah, they don't mind now anymore. It's not even a, a thing, you know. It's sort of uh, out there. It's, it's, it's a strange thing, isn't it, that you get to that stage where you can be so transparent about the fact that personal experiences have been fabricated yeah. by... yeah. Paid yeah. staff, but I changed them. I sort of, I mean, I, I changed them enough that the people involved I, I won't recognise themselves. So I hate anyone to be upset on a personal level, you know. I, my the the brother in, in law character yeah. in the last stand up show is a composite of about six or seven different people's things that they've said, so that nobody could really feel aggrieved by it and I change. I always change the ages and gender and names of my children in every. 
And every time they're mentioned in the book that I'm probably here supposed to be promoting, <laughs> March of the Lemmings, they're mentioned about a dozen times. And in each story about them, they've got different names, ages and genders. They're changed every time because I don't want to, yeah. you know, I don't want to have that that part of it, really. I don't want to really, I think, you've got to hold your life back. Um, and yeah, it's interesting because you're so protective of, and, and you provide composites of family members and yeah. loved ones, but you will, in every show, there will be an explicit sort of well-known target that will just yeah. be... Although, again, I think... I think... Well, that goes back to the old thing of, are you punching up or down, doesn't it? You know, and yeah. some of the people that... I mean, some of the people... James Corden was very upset apparently about something I did about him that I just thought was I knew he was a fan of me which is partly why I did it sort of I thought he'd like it to be to have me oh. p- being annoyed with him and st- was I spitting on him on I can't remember there was something I thought he'd think it was funny really I would I mean I only know because like, I really like The Fall yeah and then, he's dead now Marky Smith but there is people are always sending me tapes and he'd be changing lyrics to say I was a stupid cunt and things like that <laughs> and it was like really like sort of if I ever end up like Stuart Lee cut off my head with a garden tool and he, he'd sort of people go oh, have you seen he said this and and I, he probably didn't really like me because I'm a you know middle class twat but I think it was also an element of it just to be noticed by them is quite I quite liked it yeah, he, really yeah and, but when I was in the audience at gigs and I was being berated, attacked on stage, and I'd be like, I was with Munnery once watching about 97, and he, he seemed to be changing loads of lyrics and just complaining about me and saying how terrible I was. This is unbelievable. I sort of imagined it, and Munnery turns to me, it's not, it's not, it's not, I think so, yeah, it's really weird. That's so weird. So your sort of hero is referencing you in a really... Di- Maybe that's why you do it now. You I just it go, it's funny. fair I, game. I, you know, I thought it was funny. Stu, what an honour. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're so welcome. Stuart's new book, March of the Lemmings, is out now at all good bookshops and online, and you can catch him on another one of his extensive UK tours. Details can be found at stuartlee.co.uk. Yes, it's true. All the music in this episode was provided by Waiting for Smith, and if you want to check out more Waiting for Smith, then go to Spotify. As always, you can post reviews at Apple Podcasts, uh, you can post abuse to my Twitter feed at Sue Perkins. All are welcome. I'll be heading Find my peace where the desert feeds.